chose the spot We dug the hole We laid the maples in the ground To have and hold As autumn falls To winter sleep We pray that somehow in the spring The roots grow deep Spread their branches out and bless the dawn mm. Morning church, how we doing? Great, great to see you guys. My name is Bobby, I'm one of the pastors here at the Ridge. If I've not had a chance to meet you, I'd love to do that after today's service. Uh, if you're here for the first time, welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and grab that and I want you to open it up to... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be in chapters 8 and 9 together this morning. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, we'll have scripture on the screen back here behind me. You can follow along that way. Or if you have your YouVersion Bible app, you can open that up and you just click on more and then events and you'll get all of today's notes and scripture that you can follow along with there. So uh, it's good to see some of you here this morning. Some of you made some promises over the weekend and you made good on those by showing up today. You're like, what are you talking about? I know what you prayed yesterday during that game. Dear Lord, if you will please let us win, I will do whatever you ask. So you're here. So, hey, we're glad that you're here uh, today. But uh, it's good to see you guys. Hey, so uh, here's, here's the deal. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but everything in our culture, well, most everything in our culture, is really geared toward one thing and one thing only, and that's happiness. And specifically, your happiness, my happiness. Like, like everything that we hear, everything that we read, every advertisement that we run across is about your happiness and about my happiness. Even in the founding documents of our nation, there's a little line in there that is about your happiness and my happiness. You know what it says, right? The pursuit of life, liberty, and what? Happiness. Happiness. Now, happiness is not a bad thing. I, I like to be happy. You like to be happy. Happiness is not necessarily a bad thing. But in our culture, we hear and we say and we even live by the mantra to be happy. Right? Do what makes you happy. We've all heard that, right? Hey, just do what makes you happy. Or we've heard, you do you. Whatever, that means whatever you want to do, whatever makes you happy, who cares what anybody else thinks, who cares what is moral or immoral or for God or against God, doesn't really matter. You just do what makes you happy. You do you. Don't worry about anybody else. Or follow your heart. Doesn't matter what anybody else, heart has, what anybody else has in their heart. Doesn't matter what the heart of God is. What is in your heart? You follow your heart. You make your own path. You make your own way. You do your own thing. Follow your dreams. Who cares about what anybody else's dreams are? You follow your dreams. You get what you want. Why? Because we want to be happy. We want happiness. And again, to a degree, happiness is not a bad thing. We all want to be happy. We enjoy happiness. But I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but this is crazy when you think about it but every day every single day most of us in this room will be exposed to 10,000 advertisements a day 10,000 a day you might think about that it's like ah, that's a little extreme I don't think it's 10,000 like everything is an average if you watch a football game today you will see half of that at least like just in one football game right and it's not, it's not just like the commercials. You'll see it in the stadium. You'll see it on players' jerseys. You'll, I mean, you'll see it everywhere. But again, why? Because people want you to be happy. 
They want you to go and buy that happiness. They want you to spend your money and my money to gain that happiness. And all of them, all of those advertisements, uh, advertisements are supposed to make your life easier. They're supposed to make your life better. They're supposed to make your life happier, right? supposed to make us happy with ourselves buy this it'll make you happy with yourself buy this because it's all about you achieving all you want in your life you need this whatever this is right every advertisement is speaking to the heart of our souls that says we should spend our money to create for ourselves the story that we want in this life right Uh, the like for example uh, capital one credit card right all of that is about buy, it's, it's about you getting your happiness, about you creating the story that you want to live in your like car advertisements are about luxury, right? You need this. You need people to look at you to see status, right? To to be happy. And again, happiness is not a bad thing until we make it the ultimate thing. So the story our culture tells us to create is much different than the story that I think God actually calls us to. The story that culture wants us to create is in oftentimes opposition to the story that God calls us to. And the Apostle Paul here in 2 Corinthians is going to tell us to create a different story with what we've actually been given, what we actually already have. And so Paul is, Paul is actually going to tell us that there's a, a different way for us to use what we have in this life. Whereas our culture says, you need to take what you have in this life and use it to gain all the happiness that you can. Paul says there, there's something different. There's something different. Our time, our talents, and yes, even our treasures can be used to create a different kind of story that points not at us, that isn't about fulfilling our own happiness, but it actually points to Jesus. Actually, it points to glorifying our Father. And so we've been in this series about our our core values over the last couple of weeks. Like Lyle mentioned to you earlier, we talked about uh, the value of, of loving Jesus, how Jesus has to be ultimate in our lives. We talked about last week, we talked about how uh, we are called to impact the community. So when you take the great commandment where Jesus says that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then the second is to love our neighbor as ourselves, you take that com- the great commandment and then you take the great commission and you put them together, the great commission where Jesus says, I want you to go and make disciples. You put those together and that's where the value of impacting communities comes comes in and then the last core value that we have here at the ridge is to live generously to live generously and so three things that I want to talk to you about this morning there is an obstacle there is an answer and then there is a way the obstacle the answer and the way and so just a little side note here because this is really important I just just want to say this you are a very generous church You are a very generous church. You are a very generous people. Your generosity is actually what allows us to be a generous church to our community because of your generosity. Like, we we say this and we talk about these kinds of things all the time that as a church, like you and I together as believers gathered together, we make up the church. We are not the church without each other. We have to have each other. We are the church together. And so if I don't live generously and you don't live generously, then we don't get to be generous. And so it's because of your generosity that we are even able to be generous to our community. About two weeks ago, a uh, teacher at Linden Elementary School here in Oak Ridge suddenly passed away. Some of you know about this. Some of you have been a part of this. But she, she passed away, and because of your generosity this past week, you've been in the school, some of you have been in the school this whole week. So we've provided lunch and breakfast and all kinds of snacks and all kinds of other things just for the teachers and the staff there at Linden. You've done that. You, your generosity has allowed us to be able to do that and not blink an eye at it. 
Well, this, also this last week, we got an email from Secret City Academy here in Oak Ridge, and they reached out to us, and they said, hey, we, we've had this issue for a long time, and we've never really been able to, to fix it, but we constantly have students who are in need uh, of shoes that fit, shoes that don't have holes in them, and all kinds of other issues and all kinds of other things, and they reached out to us. They reached out to us here at Ridge Church. Do you know why they reached out to us here at Ridge Church? Because they know of your generosity in the city. And they said, if anybody can help us solve this issue, it's Ridge Church. And so they reached out to us and they said, we, we would love to be able to do that. So could we contact you when a student has a need and you meet that need? And we said, absolutely. But we're going to take it one step further. We're just going to go ahead and, and, and give you the money to reach that need all year long. And so here it is. And so we were able to do that this week. And not only at Secret City Academy, Linden Elementary School, like every single elementary school, you have a presence at every elementary school here in Oak Ridge. But not just here in Oak Ridge, but in Anderson County in some way. An entire county is being impacted by your generosity here at Ridge Church, which is incredible. And so it, I, I don't, here's the thing. Today's message... And again, this is just side notes before we dive into the, to the meat of this. Today's message is not about, hey, you know what? You need to give more money. It's not about that. Like, if you're new here at Rich Church, you're here for the first time, you're like, man, I showed up on the wrong day. Like, even if you're not a believer, even if you're not a Christ follower here, I think that this message can be helpful for all of us. Because, again, this is, not, this is not about you just need to give more money. Because it has nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. But here's what, here's, here's what it is about. It is about the condition of our hearts. Because here's the thing about generosity. And this is the scary thing about generosity. Generosity has nothing to do with what comes out of your wallet. It's not what comes out of your wallet. It's what comes out of your heart. And even, even more than that, Generosity is not about how much you give. It's not about how much, how, whatever that is, right? It has nothing to do with that. But it has everything to do with our life. How much of our life do we give? Because generosity is more than money. It's time, it's talent, it's resources. It's all that we've been blessed and given what do we do with that? How do we steward that? How do we give that back? And so here's the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Paul is actually going to use the, the Macedonian church as a, an example that he's giving to the Corinthians. And so 2 Corinthians is a letter that Paul writes to the church in Corinth. And he writes to them on a lot of different topics. The Corinthian church was actually kind of a jacked up kind of place, and so he's trying to sort of help set them right. But he uses the Macedonian church here in chapter 8 and chapter 9 as an example to the Corinthians to say, hey, look at their generosity. I want you to see their generosity and how it should empower and uh, be a reflection to you for your generosity, which is what we're going to look at here today. There had been this really bad famine, and the Macedonian church gave generously, they gave sacrificially, and they gave joyously, as Paul would say, not because they had a lot to give, or as what Paul says here, out of their abundance. And so when he talks to the Corinthians, he, he tells them, he says, the Macedonian church, they didn't give because they were just like, they had so much money to give that they just were like, here, take it, we don't need it, take it all, Right? He says they actually gave out of their poverty. And then he explains why. And so he wanted that to be the example for the Corinthians and for us. And so we're going to pick this up in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 8. I'm going to read through 15, and then I want to skip over to chapter 9. It says this, starting in verse 8. This is Paul speaking, again, to the Corinthians. He says, I'm not saying this as a command. And so he, he's talking about their giving. He says, I'm not saying this as a command. Rather, by means of diligence of others, I am testing the genuineness of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor. Or, I'm sorry, though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving advice, because it is profitable for you, who began last year not only to do something, but also to want to do it. Now also, finish the task, so that just as there was an eager desire, there may also be a completion according to what you have. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to... To what a person has, not according to what he does not have. It is not that there should be relief for others and hardship for you, but it is a question of equality. At the present time, your surplus is available for their need, so that their abundance may in turn meet your need, in order that there may, may be equality. As it is written, the person who had much did not have too much. And the person who had little did not have too little. Now, I want you to skip over to chapter 9, starting in verse 6. This is what he says. He says, the point is this. He sort of summarizes everything. He says, the point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. As it is written, He distributed freely, He gave to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Two more verses. Now, the one who provides seed for the sower and the bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. Verse 12, For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Now, I know that's a lot, so we're just going to dissect it a little bit here as we go over the next couple of minutes. So the first thing is this, is there is an obstacle for us. There is an obstacle that stands in the way between us and us living generously. All right? And this is the obstacle. Tim Keller, in one of his commentaries, Tim Keller writes this about generosity and particularly about this passage of Scripture. He says this, He says, over the years as a pastor, people have come to me many, many times and said, I have a problem with lust. Never, ever, ever has anyone come to me and said, Pastor, I have a problem with greed. It's never happened. And yet, the Bible warns against greed at least 10 to 20 times more than it warns against lust. Now, what does that mean? It means greed must be a bigger danger than lust, and yet... We must be many times less aware of it ourselves. The reason is because, again, there is no behavioral, a behavioral refer- referent. Paul is over and over and over again in here saying, greed versus generosity is a matter of your heart. It is a matter of the emotions. It is a matter of the attitude. It is not a matter of the gift. A widow's might, a tiny gift can be an act of radical generosity. But a huge gift might just be a heart's effort to hide its own greed from itself. Now, Keller is saying that there is no amount or behavior that lets you know if you are generous or not. And that's a problem. That's an obstacle. Because a lot of us might hear this and we might think to ourselves, well, I mean, I think I live pretty generously. How do you know? How do you know do you live generously? I think there is a way for us to know. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. But what Keller is getting at is he's saying that, that greed hides itself. It's hard to know if we're greedy. There's not a single person in this room who would probably sit here and go, you know what, I'm pretty greedy. I'm a greedy person, right? But we might admit to struggling with other things and say, yeah, I mean, I struggle with that, I struggle with this. But nobody ever wants to admit that they are greedy, Nobody. And most of us probably don't even know if we are being greedy. 
And that's the point that, that Keller is getting at. So the problem is what stands in the way of us actually living generously. And you might say, well, I mean, I live pretty generous. I give 10%. I give a tithe. I mean, that is all that's required of me, right? I mean, that's what the Bible says is give 10%. And the problem with that is the Bible doesn't actually say that. Here's where it gets dicey when it, comes to, when it comes to that. Because a lot of us, I think, have wrongly, slightly, wrongly been told that, hey, you have to give 10%. You have to give 10%. Give 10%. And that's not actually what the Bible says. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but what Paul actually said is he said that we should give according to what we have. Doesn't say anything about 10%. Doesn't, it doesn't. It's like, whoa, whoa okay, well, well, what about Jesus? I don't know if you know, Jesus actually chastises. Go to Luke chapter 12. Read it on your own. Read it for yourself. Luke chapter 12. Jesus actually chastises the Pharisees, the religious leaders, because they only gave 10% in Luke chapter 12. Do you know why? Because they could give so much more. 10% was like the, should have been the floor for them, not the ceiling for them. They didn't give out of what Paul says. They didn't give out of their abundance. So the problem, the problem with this is that we, we misunderstand this a lot of ways. Because sometimes, for some of us, like for some people, and here's the thing, and this is what Paul is getting at here. For some of us, 10% is sacrificial it is sacrificial and it is generous but there are others of us 10 percent is like not even a drop in the bucket it's not sac- like we don't even think about it. it's not sacrificial or generous because we don't even feel it and that's all paul is that's all paul is getting at here and that's what keller is trying to say is like it, greed is hard to see it's hard to find it's hard to it's hard to Pinpoint. Aren't y'all so glad you came to church this morning? Such a good topic, right? And so again, this is not just about money. We can have greed in we can have greed in, in other areas of our life. We can be greedy with our talents. Did you know that? Like some of us are some of us are greedy with the things that God has like given us a talent of that, that we have been blessed with. Here's where I think we are most greedy. I think for a lot of us, we're, and again, this is, when I say a lot of us, I don't necessarily mean all of us here in this room, because like I said before, I think you are a very generous church. I think we can all take a next step in generosity, though. We'll talk about that in a minute. But here's where I think we, a lot of us, in culture in general, even here in Rich Church, here's where I think most of us are greedy, and we don't even know that we're greedy with it. It's our time. For a lot of us, our time is worth more than our money. Do you know why I know that our time is worth more than our money? It's because we'll pay people to do things that we could do ourselves. Because we don't have the time. I do this. You do this. We all do this. Our time is worth more than our money. And I think this is where, and if you would say, if if I were to say to you, hey, I think you're greedy with your time, you'd say, I will fight you out in the parking lot. (laughs) Right? Like, we don't want to be called greedy with our time. Because you only get 24 hours in a day, right? All of us. That's true for every single person in this room. 24 hours in a day. We can be greedy with other things. It's not just money. That's why generosity is so much more than what comes out of our wallets, what comes out of our hearts. Keller continues. He finishes his thought by saying this. He says, Paul's definition of a generous heart is a frightening thing because... The only way you really know whether you are generous or greedy, whether you're greedy and materialistic or not, is not so much by how much you're giving to whom. It is by the emotions, the motivation, and the attitude that you feel toward that. And so, how then would we define a generous heart? It actually, Paul tells us right here in verse 8. He says, He says, I'm not saying this as a command, rather by means of the diligence of others, I am testing the genuineness of your love. 
is what he says. And so the, the definition of a generous heart is someone who has such a joyous, proactive desire to seek out ways to give of themselves, to give of their time, their talent, and their treasures away in such a way that we do it and we do it and we do it and we do it in such a way until it makes a measurable difference in the very way in which we live our lives. And so, does your, and so think about this. This is, this is the homework for all of us. When you think about generosity, does the way that you live generously, does it affect the way that you live your life? Does it affect the way that you spend your time? Does it affect the way that what you do with your talents? Does it affect the way that you spend your money? This is, this is what Paul is getting at here in, in when it talks about the generosity. And so this is an obstacle for us. We have to face the obstacle. We have to look at it dead in the eye. And we have to be honest with ourselves. And think about these things for ourselves. And so how do we get past the obstacle? What's the answer then, number two, the answer to the obstacle? There's a couple of different parts to this. But the first thing is this. is The first thing that we have to do is that we have to realize all that we have been given. All that we have is not necessarily by the sweat of our brow, but it is from the blessing of God. It all comes, ultimately, it all comes from Him. Every bit of it. Every bit of it comes from Him. And you're like, but you don't understand. Like, you don't know how hard I work to get this. How hard I've worked to be. You know what? I believe that. You have worked really hard for that. Whatever you have, you've worked hard for. By the sweat of your brow, you have done so. Who gave you the opportunity, though? And listen, we'll go back and forth all day. Like, you'd be like, well, it's because I did this and because I did that and because I, like, I'll help you connect the dots, my friend. We'll go as far back as you need to go. Like, the ability to do what you do, whether it be how smart you are or how Uh, ingenious you are or whatever it it may be it all comes from God and until we recognize that until we see that until we change our perspective and go man all that I have has been given to me by him Uh, if you you don't have to turn there but in Exodus chapter 16 there is this um, there's this moment where uh, Moses has taken the people of God uh, has taken them and help rescue them by God, God has rescued them actually, from captivity in Egypt, and they're in the wilderness, and they start to complain. Exodus chapter 16, they start to grumble and complain because they're hungry. And if you know the story of the Exodus, you know that all that God has done for the people of Israel, how he miraculously saved them and rescued them and helped them and has guided them and all of these great things and the people of Israel they start to complain and they even say this they said if only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt they're basically saying we're so hungry out here Moses you've brought us out here in the middle of the desert and we would have been better off being slaves back in Egypt what have you done like we would have been better off if we just would have died in there I mean they're, they're like major complaining right so God hears their complaint, hears their mumble, and he says, okay, here's the deal. Here's what's going to happen. They're going to go to sleep, and they're going to wake up, and when they wake up, there's going to be bread on the ground. Manna, right? Bread from heaven. Where did the bread come from? It came from God, right? And then he gives them some instructions about it. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to gather it up, but I only want you to gather what you need. Not everything that you want. Don't do that. Don't be greedy. Just get what you need. And then in the evening, there's going to be quail on the ground. You're going to have bread, and you're going to have meat, and you ain't going to have to work for it. All you got to do is go out and gather it. Now, there's something, I think, to be said, because some people gathered more, and some people were only able to gather less, but they took all that they had, and they put it all together and said, everybody gets what they need. And then God tells them this. He says, if you keep anything more than what you need, it's going to rot. It's going to be useless. You're going to wake up in the morning and it's going to be filled with maggots. That sounds delicious. But God does this to remind the people of Israel who is the provider. 
Who is the one who gives? Who is the one who blesses? Where does it come from? It comes from the Lord. And why does that matter? Because it came from God and they failed to recognize that it was from God. Uh, Paul says this to the Colossians in his letter to Colossians, Colossians 1.16. He says, For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him, and listen, for Him. For Him. And so we have to recognize where it all comes from. That's, that's important. The second thing is this, is that we have to ask ourselves this question. Am I living and giving generously? Am I giving regularly? Am I doing it sacrificially? And then I think this is the, the part that we often miss. Do, it, do I do it with a joyous heart? Do I do it with a joyous heart? And so, think about this generously. Is it, when we think about our giving, and again, not just money, time, talent, resources, all of it together, our lives. Am I giving generously? Go back to 2 Corinthians 8. We didn't read this, but in verse 2 it says this. It says, during a severe trial brought about by affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. I can testify that according to their ability and even beyond their ability of their own accord. And it says they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing. Like, that's, that's amazing. So when we think about generosity, Paul is saying, hey, look at the Macedonian church. Like, they didn't have anything to give. They weren't wealthy. They weren't rich. They didn't just have a bunch of stuff laying around. We're like, here, take this. We, we don't want it. You need, like, here. Like, no, they were poor. But they looked for a way to be generous. Matthew, if you go to the book of Matthew, Matthew gives us an example of something that happened to Jesus. I'll read it for you. Matthew chapter... 26 it says this it says while jesus was in bethany at the house of simon the leper a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume she poured it on his head and he was while he was reclining at the table when the disciples saw it they were indignant that means they were mad why why this waste they asked that might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor aware of this jesus said to them why are you bothering this woman she has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. By pouring this perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Jesus isn't discarding the poor here. Jesus was for the poor. We know that. He wasn't, he wasn't disregarding them. He was, a, he was simply just saying... Like, what has happened here is a, an act of generosity. Like, yeah, it could have been sold. It could, you could have gotten a bunch of money out of this. But it's not about that. It's about generosity. And so you, you and I have to ask ourselves the question, is, is what we give of ourselves, is it generous? Secondly, is it sacrificial? One of the ways that the message translation describes what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is he says that the heart regulates the hands. Just think about that. The heart regulates or controls what comes out of the hands. That's why we talk about this as being a, a heart issue, right? And so uh, we have to ask our, simply ask ourselves the question, is, is what we give of ourselves, is it sacrificial? And by sacrificial, going back to what I said previously, is the way that we give, has it changed the way that we live? Has it changed the way that we live, what we do with our time and our talent and our resources? Because then it becomes sacrificial. Paul uses the Macedonian church as an example to say, look at their sacrifice. Look at the way that they sacrificed of themselves. And he writes here, he says, he says this, he says, At the present time, your surplus is available for their needs so that their abundance may in turn meet your need in order that there may be equality. The person who had much did not have too much and the person who had little did not have too little. That that sacrifice helped everyone. And so is it sacrificial? And then, is it regular? We talk about this a lot. Is, is it regular? Do we give regularly paul says this in galatians chapter 6 he says let us not get tired 
of doing good. It's talking about, hey, regularly do good as much as possible, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. There's probably a whole sermon in that one verse right there, but we're just talking about the, the, the regularity of our generosity. And then the last one is do we give joyously? If you pay any attention every single Sunday, like I'll do today, when we stand up, when we close, when we sing a song together and we, we have our time of giving, which again, we will not make a big deal. We, don't, we never make a big deal out of that, that moment in our service. It's not about you giving more today or giving, what, it has nothing to do with that. But every time I pray, every time I pray, I pray the same thing. God, let us give generously, let us give sacrificially, and let us do it with glad, joyous hearts. Every Sunday I pray that. Because that's what I want for us. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for every one of us, is that we would do it joyously. Even if it hurts a little. Even if it is sacrificial. That we do it joyously. Paul says this, if you go over to... Uh, chapter 9, in verse 6, he says the point of this, those who sow sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart. There again, not about the tithe. What has God put in your heart to do? Not reluctantly or out of compulsion. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful. God loves it when the, the giver delights in giving. And so the Macedonians, they saw their giving as a get-to, not a have-to. Do you look at your giving that way? Do you get to give your time? Do you get to give your money? Do you get to give your talents? Or do you feel like you have to? I'm just going to go ahead and say this to you. If you feel like you have to, don't. Don't give it here. We don't want it. I don't want you to feel like you have to. I want you to feel like you get to. And if you feel like you get to, that's, that's, just, that's a heart issue between you and the Lord. And I'm, you, you need to get with the Lord and figure that part out. And so don't until you feel like you get to. I don't want you to feel like you have to. God doesn't want you to feel like you have to. He wants us to do it. That's what it means to have a glad and joyous heart. And so imagine if we went home this week, and for those of us who call Rich Church home, and, and we just asked ourselves these questions or had these conversations. Am I, do I give generously? Do I do it sacrificially? Am I regular with my giving? Do I do, I do it with a glad and joyous heart? And then the last, last point is this. How, how, that's, that's the answer. If, that, if the obstacle is this greed that we may not see, and if the answer is to, to be able to do so generously, sacrificially, regularly, and with glad and joyous hearts, how, how are we even able to do that? How are we even able to do that? The answer is simple. But 2 Corinthians 9 the NLT translation in verse 6, it translates it like this. Again, NLT is kind of a paraphrase, but I think it paints a, a really clear picture for us. It says this. It says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. And we might hear that, and we might think of that. We may have even been taught that, Oh, okay, so if I give and I give generously, then God's going to start dropping checks in my lap, down in the mailbox, in my bank account, all of a sudden. And listen, true story, that may happen at some point. It might. I'm not telling you that it won't. God can do whatever God wants to do. Is this what this means? It's not. It's not what that means. If, if we were to just take that and go, well, that's what that means. I mean, what is this? What is this crop or harvest that we're supposed to get? We can't, we can't go prosperity gospel here and think that, that if we give a lot, God's going to just drop money in our bank accounts. This is not the way that it works. 
Another way to say it would be like this, that generous giving to God results in greater giving from God. And that could come in a lot of different ways. A lot of different ways. And so in verse 8, verse 8 here in chapter 9, it says that, that we are given. It says, God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way we always have everything you need. We want to substitute need for want. I think, well, if I give, if I do this, if, I, if I'm generous and sacrificial and all this, then God's going to give me everything that I want. No, 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 no. Remember the manna, right? Everything that you need, not what we want necessarily. And so what is, what is this harvest that we get? Verse 10, it says this, And now the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for the food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Let me just, look, Paul is just saying this. He, he's saying that you have given more so that you can, or you have, you, I'm sorry, you have been given more so that you can actually give more. You see, American Christianity says that, that we have been given more only so that we can have more. But Christ-centered Christianity says that we have been given more so that we can give more. God gives enough for us. And he gives enough for us in excess for others. So again, Paul is just saying that, that when you use what you have, when you and I give what we have, not just money, time, talent, treasures, all of these things, our lives, when we give our, of ourselves, we are helping make full-formed lives alive in God, wealthy in every way, which isn't material wealth, but spiritual wealth, and it all produces great praise to God. That's what he says here at the end of 9. And when we live generously for the glory of God, we are putting ourselves into a role in a part of God's great story. Living generously, putting our generosity into ministry helps bring people to Jesus, to live and to follow Jesus. And we are using what we have been given to do this. Because this is what Jesus did. He used what he had been given to do the same. He used his power to heal, to save, to rescue, to bring life. He used his life and laid it down generously, not as his own life, but gave it away to knit people to God. So we are only able because God first gave to us, and he gave us everything. All that he had, his own life. I want you to think about this. Let me actually let me just read this. Verse 15. Paul says this in chapter 9. He says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Why does Paul say that? Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. He's talking about giving and generosity, and he's talking about all these things, but he ends, he ends this thought with, with this. Why does he say this? Because he's saying that every other gift in this world, you and I, we have to purchase. Jesus is the only gift that purchased us. And once we get this, once we see this, it will change if we live gener generously or not. It'll change our approach to all that we have. It'll change our approach and our thoughts about our time, our talents, and most definitely the way that we see our money. If we, listen, if we are afraid to be generous with any of these things, like if, if the fear of giving generously of our time, our talent, and our resources, if that fear grips us and stops us from actually giving of ourselves in that way, I think what that says of us is it says that that is actually where we put our hope. Our security is not in the Lord. Our security is not that He is going to provide all that we need. It might not be all that we want. But all that we need, our security is going, well, God's going to give me those things that I need. I'm going to go get what I want. And again, to a degree, 
that's okay. To a degree, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with having a nice house. There's nothing wrong with having a nice car. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy to a degree. But is that where your security is? Is that where your hope is? Is that the things that we hold on to and say, i got to have this because if I don't have this, I can't live. If we are afraid to be generous with any of these things, that thing is our hope. It's not Jesus because we're afraid to put it into his hands and trust him with it. You might be thinking, well, I thought you weren't going to make us feel guilty. (laughs) That's not guilt. It's called called conviction. You might be, as we close, you you might be thinking that, you know what, I I don't really like any of this. It feels really, really hard to do. It feels hard to live that way. And let me, can I just be honest with you? It is. It is hard to live that way. It's not easy. It is a struggle. That's why it's called sacrificial giving. I've been telling you this for 13 years now, that following Jesus is a call to radical and different living. Jesus never said it was going to be easy. He didn't say... He didn't say anything about it being easy. In fact, God said it would be a call to come and die to yourself. You ever think about that? It means that to, we have to replace all of our wants and desires with His wants and desires for our lives, for His glory. And that doesn't mean that we don't get some things that we desire. It doesn't mean that we don't get some things that we want. It's just that those things happen to come in secondary And that we are joyously glad with that. Loving Jesus. Working to make an impact on the community. Living generously will likely not get you everything that you want in this life. And if I'm being honest with you, it will probably not make you happy by the world's standards. But you'll have more. You'll have more joy. You'll have all that you need. You'll glorify your Father in heaven and you'll reflect Jesus as salt and light to a world and culture that is desperately disappearing in the darkness. So imagine, what, what would happen if we all began to, to live this way? If every, if every believer, not just us in this room, Every believer lived this way, to, to live generously. He said, you know what, I'm going I'm to live generously. And I can't do it on my own because you can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. None of us can do it on our own. It is all based upon our trust and faith in Jesus. But if we live this way, I read a study not too long ago that said if every believer, just believer, not every American, but every believer in America Gave this way, we could eliminate poverty for the world and solve the world's hunger and water issues in just two years. Just believers. And so our money and our generosity, it has a mission. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we get our generosity involved in God's mission? to make our generosity reflect the gospel. We are are all giving to something. We We all give to something, but does it reflect the gospel? Is it part of God's miraculous distribution plan? Because when we give it, like, he multiplies it. He does, like... Like what you give and what I, I give, what, what we all give, each individually may be different. And that's so it should be different. I don't even know, like, I don't even know what people give. But by the way, if you're ever wondering about that, like, do I know, like, what you give? I, I know what we give. I don't know what you give. I don't care what you give. I, I really don't. What I care about is that you do it generously, sacrificially, and with joyous hearts. And so I don't even look. I don't even know. I know what we do as a church. But is it, reflect, is it a reflection of the gospel? I'll close with this. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 through 8, 
the name of this series. We actually started this planting tree series probably eight years ago, I think. And it comes from it comes from this couple of verses here in Jeremiah 17. But it says this, starting in verse 5, it says, This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. Not salty in the good way that we talked about last week. But blessed, listen to this, are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank. That's where it comes from. With roots that reach deep into the water, such trees are not bothered by the, heart or by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they will never stop producing fruit. That's our hope. That's my hope. That's my prayer for you is that we will be like these planted trees. That we will live in such a way that that the love of Jesus is illuminated wherever you live, work, and play. That we will make an impact wherever we go because of the gospel. And that we will live our lives in such a way with such generosity that it inspires others to live generously and that when we do so, we get to point back to Jesus and say, hey, the only way that I'm able to live generously is because he gave his life for me. Will you pray with me? (coughs) Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we pray. (coughs) God, we pray that, that your word helps transform us. God, if, it, if we need conviction, if we need um, <coughs> just a, a loudness of your voice in our soul this morning, God, God, that you would just speak to us. God, that you would show us, you would show us the path for us. God, whether it be repentance or praise or thankfulness or gratefulness or whatever it is, God, God, this is, this is not about us trying harder. This is just about trusting you. So, Father, help us trust you in all these things. God, with our, with our money, God, with our time, with our talent, God, we know that if we will put it into your hands, God, you will multiply it. You will give us all that we need. You will give us excess for others that they need. And so help us put it into your hands. It's in your name we pray.